You know, when I was growing up, my uh, uh, version of the story of America was a heroic story. I'm actually from Lexington, Massachusetts. So as far as I'm concerned, America is the story of my town, and then other people came. Uh, and when I was growing up, the story of America was a heroic story. The American Revolution, the Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement, uh, uh, whatever it was. It was always the immigrants coming to our shores, fighting World War II. It was always the story of how in America there were struggles and in the end freedom won. Or if it didn't win the first time, eventually freedom won. Sometimes there were setbacks. And it was always that story. That was the story of our history. We are living in a moment, uh, uh, which at least a lot of people think is one of those moments of struggle again, in which our commitment to civil liberties is in question. Uh, in some ways, rightly so, we face very real threats. Civil discussions about civil liberties are the places in America where you answer the question, what do you really care about? What do you care about so deeply that you'll give up your own interests or even some portion of your own security for the sake of preserving these things? And whatever your answer is to that question, that's what you believe in. There's this great debate going on, uh, uh, exemplified among others by Richard Posner and Bruce Ackerman, but lots of other people. And, and the debate is between the camp that says uh, uh, you really should never restrict civil liberties unless it's absolutely necessary, uh, unless our survival is at stake. Uh, and the camp that says, well, no, you've got to be more responsive to circumstances than that. And you've got to recognize that if there are exigent circumstances, then we'll accept things we wouldn't otherwise accept. And that's the nature of the beast, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it, in practice, that quickly becomes a debate about just how exigent are the current circumstances. I mean, let's be clear. After the attacks of 9-11, there was really very little possibility of the United States surrendering to Al-Qaeda. That was not a likely outcome. Uh, there was really very little chance of the Taliban taking over the United States of America. That really wasn't going to happen. Uh, and for some people, that's uh, an important point. For some people, that says this isn't quite like the American Civil War or the British invasion in 1812 or even the American role in World War II. On the other hand, 9-11 uh, certainly made it very clear that we are vulnerable to and, and the target of violent, disruptive, destructive attacks. Uh, and that's certainly clear. So part of the debate ends up being kind of a factual debate about just how great is the danger that faces us and, and what works, a kind of pragmatic debate of what's effective. But a lot of the debate goes back much further. Uh, I'm reminded of the first free speech cases in the period around World War I, and the idea of the clear and present danger test. And then the big debate was between one side that said, well, there were more than two sides, but one side that said, if there's a clear and present danger, uh, that speech will lead to a bad consequence, that justifies punishing it. And the other side, uh, led by uh, uh, people like Holmes and Brandeis, said, no, no, you can only punish speech if the speech is an imminent threat, is itself dangerous. And Holmes used a famous analogy, shouting fire in a crowded theater. Well, in a way, that's what this whole debate is, is, is about. Uh, 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 in one sense, everyone involved in these debates agrees that in the face of sufficient danger, we should be willing to accept some limitations on civil liberties. The question is how much danger and how much limitation. One of the biggest trade-offs over the last hundred years has been about free speech. On the one hand, we like to say we are a country founded on the principle of free speech, and particularly in comparison with the British history of the 18th century, we did not accept the idea of the government having the authority to tell people what to think or what religion to practice or what political views to hold. And so we have this very, very strongly grounded uh, narrative in American history that we are the country of free speech. And it goes back to that heroic story I mentioned before. Sometimes there are setbacks. McCarthyism was perhaps unfortunate. In the 1920s, we put people in jail for having the wrong political views. But we outgrew that. We matured. Uh, we're better now. And we understand the core centrality of free speech to all forms of freedom. Well, that's great. But right now, we're engaged in a, a, a deadly conflict on a global scale uh, with forces who are aligned with a movement that has a very particular religious ideology. And are we still just as committed? Uh, uh, are we still just as sure 
that it's crucial to us that people be allowed to give radio broadcasts explaining how wonderful Al-Qaeda is or why America is evil and must be destroyed. Uh, even now, uh, the way we may have been before 9-11. And it goes back to what I said before, what you, how seriously you take civil liberties or, or what civil liberties you take really seriously define what you think America is about. Because if your answer is yes, preserving free speech and preserving a full-fledged commitment to free speech is more important than silencing people who might be rousing our enemies. That's a strong statement. That's, that's putting something on the line. And if you say no, uh, uh, free speech is terribly important, but it has limits. We have to figure out what those limits are, and, and moments of genuine threat to our nation are times to examine those limits. Well, that says something else. It's not a wrong answer or a bad answer, but it shows your thinking about what America is all about in a really deep way. And to, that, to my mind, that's what makes the debates about civil liberties so interesting and so profound. One of the things I find so interesting, I find very interesting, is that people who talk about American politics often get cynical. And you often have people saying, Americans don't have consistent beliefs or deep beliefs. They just support whatever outcome they like and they'll change their tune on a moment's notice to support their candidate or their party or their outcome or the people they like. And I find that to be absolutely nonsense. Uh, I am constantly struck by how deeply people have uh, genuine and largely consistent beliefs about the importance of civil liberties. For some people, preserving civil liberties is what America is all about, what the Constitution is all about. It's the, it's the thing we're fighting for. And for those people, any sacrifice of civil liberties or any argument justifying sacrificing civil liberties is anathema. Uh, it's criminal. For other people, uh, the idea of civil liberties is part of a larger parcel of values uh, uh, and, and they view people who are too strenuously committed to civil liberties, if I can put it that way, uh, as dangerous because they're a threat to those other parts of the things they value so highly. But the one thing I find over and over and over is that Americans, when we argue with each other about things like civil liberties and national security and free speech, we argue in a very consistent and principled way. I do not find people who change their beliefs quickly or on a whim. You can make people think twice. You can give them a difficult hypothetical case. You can uh, introduce them to historical literature that causes them to see a depth that they didn't previously recognize. Uh, uh, you can push them uh, uh, and test them with a question that makes them acknowledge a limitation they didn't otherwise immediately acknowledge. But in my experience, the vast majority of Americans, their starting point is some strongly held and really very consistent core belief in what's important. And those beliefs are articulated in terms of what they believe about civil liberties more than about any other thing I can think of. One of the reasons I love not only writing about but teaching about the Constitution is that when we have in this country debates about constitutional principles, the usual categories of Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative almost immediately become almost worthless. Now that's a radical statement and there are lots of people, including political scientists, who would disagree with me. But here's what I mean. Take the current war on terror uh, uh, and concerns that were especially raised during the Bush administration but that continue to be raised now in the Obama administration about the question, does the executive have too much power? Have, have these two presidents, the two presidents we've had now presiding during the war against terrorism or terrorist organizations, have they seized more power than they should have? Or have they seized new and previously unprecedented powers. And you find something very interesting. And the interesting thing is that usually we think people who are originalists, people who want to say we should interpret the Constitution the way the founders did, we call them conservatives. And usually people who say we have to make the Constitution be flexible, we have to adjust its meaning according to current circumstances, we call them liberals. Well, here's a case where those two are completely reversed. Uh, if we can stereotype and say liberals are the kind of people whom we expect to say the presidents are taking too much power, well, they're the ones who are being the originalists. They're saying the framers didn't want presidents to have this kind of power. That proves it must be wrong. And if we assume that conservatives are the people we expect to say uh, it's good that the presidents have new and expansive powers because of the war against terrorism, well, we now have conservative legal thinkers saying, well, we need new, creative, original ways of thinking about the Constitution in the face of this new threat. I don't think that that's the slightest bit hypocritical or inconsistent. I think what it shows is how unhelpful it is to try and pigeonhole people in terms of political or partisan or party categories when we're talking about the Constitution and, and sort of the deeper meaning 
Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville once very famously said, any really important philosophical question in America eventually comes before the courts. And I think that's right. I think we argue about the Constitution and its meaning when we want to have an argument about our deepest political and philosophical commitments. We argue about tax policy in terms of parties or healthcare reform. But when we get down to the deep questions, we tend to start talking about the Constitution. And when we do that, I find that the disagreements and the conflicts are just much more interesting and much deeper and much more profound than the usual language of liberal or conservative captures. There are a lot of different ways that a scholar can research the kinds of questions I'm talking about, civil liberties or, 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 or things like that. Uh, and I've actually done more than one in different projects. Uh, I've done some historical work, which involves digging in the archives. Uh, I wanted to, to figure out how people in the late 19th century, uh, middle, sorry, middle 19th century, uh, thought about law and its relation to society. And so to do that, I read a, a huge number of state court cases from Illinois and Virginia and about six other states. Uh, and, and just recorded notes on all the things that the judges said and the lawyers said in these case files, and then sat down and sifted through them uh, and tried to make sense of it all and went back to the political debates of the time by reading the records of constitutional, state constitutional ratifying conventions uh, to see what people were talking about and, and read newspaper articles. And this is the kind of work uh, historians do, and, and I was trained as an historian initially, uh, but I was very aware that I was doing it as a political scientist. And the difference is, I didn't just want to figure out what was being said, I wanted to figure out what it meant uh, and what its consequences were for the shape of what came out of it all and how it resonates with the way we still think about politics today. Um, I've written other things where essentially uh, uh, all I did is read lots and lots and lots of court cases, modern court cases. And I've written more philosophical things and, and, and those are the sorts of projects I work on now. And the way you do those is you read what people in the field are saying. It's a big conversation. The historian, uh, the political scientist, political scientist and historian Isaac Kramnik once referred to the 1770s as the great national conversation. And I've always loved that phrase. Uh, when you do philosophical and theoretical work, it's not like a statistical project where you have a particular question you want to answer. And then you figure out a model for gathering data. And then you go gather the data and see if it answers the question. It isn't really like that. It's more a matter of there is a conversation going on with widely different views by people who have spent many years, each of them, thinking about the question uh, that covers a range of questions. And there's a thread in this conversation that I want to follow up on and I want to say something about. And then you go and do the work to be in a position uh, to be able to say something about that thread. And that involves, among other things, uh, doing the best you can to know what everybody else has said about it, which can be a lot. Uh, it can involve historical or empirical work, after all, to say something interesting you might actually have to know something real about the world. Um, it can even involve statistics sometimes. But what frames the research, what frames the inquiry, is not, I want to know the answer to this particular question. It's much more, I want to respond to this particular discussion. I think that's the big difference. We've been talking about uh, national security and civil liberties, and, and there's a good reason for that, given the times that we live in, and given the times, that's always a fundamental and central question uh, for any constitutional system, especially ours. I do find that there are other uh, equally profound problems of constitutionalism, uh, which can be described as civil liberties, uh, that, are f that, that are central to American politics that I hope to explore in, my, in, in the writing that I'm doing now. Um, for example, consider the question of the place of religion in politics. Or consider more deeply the problem of how do we maintain a democracy in which we're sure we can talk to each other. And sometimes, historically, people have tried to answer that by saying, well, everyone should have to speak the same political language. Everyone should have to be an American. I mean, some, some sort of melting pot notion of political homogenization that results in us all talking in the same way. And the problem with that is people who have deep religious beliefs or different cultures uh, or who for one reason or another see the world, perceive themselves to see the world very differently than do their fellow citizens, feel excluded by those kinds of principles and those kinds of rules. On the other hand, uh, uh, there's a reason to be worried. There's a reason to think that we ought not to let what's sometimes called a sectarian worldview, one that's particular to a group, 
to take over. We are a country with enormous differences. We're enormously pluralistic and enormously heterogeneous. And one of the things our Constitution is clearly set up to do uh, uh, is to allow the democracy to be ongoing despite the fact of that pluralism. There are people in Europe, especially right now, who are saying, you know, maybe democracy is only possible if we all are the same, if we all have the same religion, or we all have the same ethnicity, or we all have the same culture. That's never been the American approach. But I also don't think that the American democracy has ever been more powerfully tested by differences of religion and culture uh, and by differences over the role of those kinds of deeply held beliefs in political discourse than is happening today. Uh, I think there have been other periods in our history where this has been a big issue, but I certainly think it's a big issue right now. Uh, and so you have people saying it's improper. Uh, uh, we ought not to let people's religious views dictate the kind of laws we have. And we have other people saying we ought not to let anyone say that you can't make laws based on your religious views. And I think that is a deep, intractable problem. I think that's one of those deep and profound philosophical problems. Well, what do we mean by American democracy that arguments about the Constitution are all about? And so I would like to work, I'd like to do some deep thinking if I can and some writing on those kinds of questions in, in, in my next project. In fact, I'm working on something about that right now. When a student comes to me and asks, what should I major in, or, or, or should I major in political science? Uh, uh, I always like to think of it in terms of what kinds of questions do you like to think about? Now, obviously, political science and physics think about very different questions, so that's not what we're talking about. But political science and history, or political science and sociology, uh, or philosophy, uh, they think about questions that overlap, but they think about them differently. And I like to think that what political science has that none of those other disciplines have to the same degree is a focus on the so what question. No matter what you're studying or what you're talking about, you have to have a good answer for why the question matters. And you've got to be able to answer why the question matters for the way we live now. And, and to my mind, that's what's sometimes missing in those other disciplines that are otherwise in some ways quite close to political science. I didn't start out as a, 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 a political scientist or even as an academic. I was a lawyer first. I practiced law for five years, and a, uh, first as a criminal prosecutor and then as a lawyer in a big firm in San Francisco. Uh, the money was good. The hours were terrible. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, I, just, I didn't care about what I was doing. The work was, was difficult without being interesting, and I simply didn't care who won the cases. Uh, and you have to care about what you do. So I went off to become a college teacher. Uh, an academic. Uh, first I tried history and then I ended up transferring from there into political science. And the reason was that I was deeply interested in studying America and studying the way America works and, and uh, American law and politics and American thinking. Uh, but it goes back to what I mentioned before which is that in the shift from history to political science I got to focus much more directly on so what. That is, what is it about what I'm studying that actually explains something or, or, or gives a deeper understanding of something that's really going on that I can see right now?